So let's go over some of the basic things in evolution that affect plants as they do other organisms. You'll remember from ecology that evolution via natural selection is sometimes called survival of the fit fittest, where fitness isn't physical fitness but reproductive success or the number of offspring that survive to reproduce. It's important to remember also that natural selection acts not on the genotype, but the phenotype. The expression of the genes in an individual that are the attributes of an individual organism. The phenotype of any organism, plants included, is determined by both genes and the environment. And then individuals that are best suited for the prevailing environment are selected for, that is, they reproduce better, having greater fitness, leaving more survivors, and passing on more of their genes to the next generation. Remember the three kinds of natural selection, stabilizing selection, acting on a normal distribution to select for the intermediate type, the average, so that the distribution goes from a normal curve to one sharper hump in the middle, directional selection to one extreme or another, and disruptive selection in which both extremes are favored. So some traits are heritable, but you have to remember that part of the phenotype of an individual is shaped just by response to the environment. The first adaptations that organisms make to the environment are often plastic, but these changes can become fixed in their genome if it's evolutionarily advantageous. Variation in the phenotype is equal to variation in the genotype plus variation from the environment. I guess I should say variance rather variation. And the ge genetic differences that cause this variation are heritable. And heritability can be defined narrowly or broad. In a narrow sense, heritability is just additive genetic variation. H squared is how people refer to heritability very often. So this is variance additive over the phenotypic variation. Broad sense heritability is the total genetic variation, so this includes dominance and also epistatic variation. So in this graph, on the x-axis, mean parental height is plotted against offspring height, and you can see that there is some relationship but the heritability is only 21%, and that's because many things are involved in size of individuals. It can also be that differences among individuals can depend on the interaction of their genes with the environment, and these interactions are the genetic component of phenotypic plasticity. So the middle term here, variation of gene time environment. So these data in this graph were generated by taking a number of different plants and dividing them up into ramets, different pieces of the same genotype, and subjecting them to different growing conditions, different environments, low light on the left versus high light on the right. And you can see that different genotypes respond differently. One genotype here, this one, shows no change over the light environment, whereas others, this one is much taller in higher light, and others less drastically so. So the genotype by environment interaction is basically the difference in slope of these different lines, the extent to which the lines are not parallel to one another. And there's a lot of phenotypic plasticity shown in plants within an individual and between individuals. 
sun versus shade leaves and plants that grow in the sun versus plants that grow in the shade. Different individuals of the same species, sometimes even different pieces of the same genet. In aquatic plants, leaves along the same stem look different depending whether they're poking up out of the water or under the water. And many plants have different forms depending on the prevailing wind. They can grow upright or they can grow very close to the ground, prostrate. So here's the touch-me-not in Patience Capensis, on the plant on the left grown in the sun. Shorter plants, and in this case, bigger leaves. The plant grown in the shade, very long and skinny with small leaves searching for the sun. Here's a beautiful graphic from a paper by Lewis who looked at leaf variation in geraniums in a forest and you can see that leaves growing in the dry and the open on the left are much more dissected versus those in moist shaded habitat have a lot more lamina per area of the leaf. And here are some plants that show dimorphic leaves on the same individual on the left the water lotus, new far, the emergent leaves smooth and entire, those that are submerged have a raggedy margin. Ranunculus trichophilus at the top, emergent leaves, folios, and those that are submerged, very dissected. And we can see the same with erigeron, heteromorphous on the right. So a team of scientists working in the mountains of California, influenced by the work of Tourison, who brought different uh, sizes and shapes of the same species to a common garden to see how much of their differences were environmentally determined. These three scientists, Clausen, Keck, and Heise, did reciprocal transplant experiments with plants from different elevations in the Sierra Nevada. And to do these experiments, they used the property of many plants that they're easy to clone or divide into different pieces. So by planting these individuals at different places, they looked at differences in morphology and phenology. And later scientists looked at how much plants put toward reproduction versus vegetative growth, their photosynthetic characteristics, and water use. But here's a graph I love from one of their original papers looking at plant size of Achillea lanulosa, the yarrow, at different places. And here is a, at each site, the arrow points to where that site is in the transect across the Sierra Nevada, a silhouette of the plants and how they looked, and a graph showing the distribution of individuals. So this is the mean and this is a frequency distribution of height variation among a number of plants sampled for each one. You can see that in general lower at lower elevations the plants were taller. The western side of the Sierra Nevada is much wetter than the drier side on the right where the plants are shorter and you can see at higher elevations plants are smaller and flower less. So for reciprocal transplant experiments, they moved clones from one of one plant to different elevations. And here are clones from Mather, the intermediate site, grown at the different elevations. You can see that the same clone or individual is all in one row here. So pieces of the same plant grown at Mather got a little taller when they grew in Stanford or shorter. And these are different genetic individuals of the same species. So some showed that same pattern but couldn't make it at the highest elevation. They died. So I just love these beautiful pictures of the data. So they could conclude that some differences were genetically based but others were simply the result of the environment acting on the plants. But it's important that they did demonstrate local race formation, as they called it. And these races 
they called ecotypes, populations of a species that have genetically based phenotypic differences. But later, ecologists realized that these ecotypes are simply spe specified parts of a, an ecocline or continuum. If there's an abrupt change in environmental conditions, maybe there truly are ecotypes, but in the mountains, the changes are more gradual. And the genetic differences among these ecotypes results from natural selection by the local environments on the plants. Sometimes ecotypes have been recognized taxonomically. One example is plants that live in habitats that have been contaminated by heavy metals. And in these studies are the first demonstrations of fine-scale genetic differentiation in response to an environmental factor. Because in most situations, you have gradients in genetic composition resulting from genetic differentiation and adaptation, and these are clines. So in Great Britain, there was a lot of mining in the last century, and Tony Bradshaw and his students, all who became famous plant population geneticists, studied plants growing around the abandoned mines. Mine waste contamination, they're called tailings, of zinc and copper in the case of their studies, were leftovers from pulling out the minerals, and these tailings were dumped outside of the mines. Mostly plants couldn't grow on this toxic ground, but certain plants were able to grow there. For example, two grasses, Anthoxanthum and Agrostis. The populations that were growing on the mine tailings were tolerant of the heavy metals, while different populations of the same species of plants, those that grew in nearby pastures, could not survive with the heavy metals. And it turned out that the tolerant plants had evolved biochemical mechanisms that let them not take up the toxic ions. And this difference had evolved over very short distances and in only a few generations. In this figure from our book, you can see that the index of copper tolerance on the y-axis was much lower for plants in pastures than for plants that were growing on the mine tailings. And the two bars are the lighter bar for adults, the shorter bar for seeds. So this was an example of very local adaptation. And what would happen is that cross-pollination between the heavy metal tolerant and the pasture plants would yield offspring that were less tolerant. So another mechanism evolved to reduce cross-pollination and the tolerant plants bloomed earlier and also became more self-pollinating. That reinforced the genetic differentiation of the populations. And that genetic isolation led to eventual speciation. This topic also is a good place to talk about convergent evolution, where unrelated groups of plants end up looking the same, and we see the same adaptations of form repeated in similar environments in different parts of the world. So these can be extreme morphologies like stem succulents, rosette growth form, and even extrafloral nectaries. In the old world, there are not cacti, but there are plants that look like cacti in the Euphorbiaceae. In the new world, that's where we find the Cactaceae with leaves reduced to spines and succulents in the stem. And the rosette form can be seen in the Lobeliaceae in Africa and in Espelidia, which is in the Asteraceae in the Andes, New World. Extrafloral nectaries are glands that many plants have outside of the flowers, usually not involved with pollination, and many plants in the legume family have them in various locations on the plant, on the leaf stalk or the petiole, the middle of the leaf uh, midrib, the rachis, or on stipules, outgrowths of the leaf base. 
Nectaries have a wide range of anatomical complexity, and many other taxa, not just legumes, also have them. So these features presumably evolved many times in response to generalized ant attraction for protection. Here are a couple of plants with extrafloral nectaries at the top, the back of the leaf of Hibiscus tiliaceus. You can see the trough-shaped nectary here and some ants coming to take the nectar. And here's Morinda royoc, a pretty plant in the rubiaceae, whose nectaries, floral nectaries, actually function after the flower is gone, maybe to attract ants to protect the developing fruit. So what is a plant species? It's a little tricky with plants. Ernst Meyer first described a biological species as a group of potentially interbreeding organisms reproductively isolated from other such groups. But what we see in plants is a lot more hybridization going on, hybridization that makes viable offspring. So in plants, new species can arise allopatrically in different places, with geographical separation between populations, parapatrically when things are to um, sites are adjacent, or sympatrically, even in the same location, but maybe specializing on different resources, strategies, or interactions like pollination. So hybridization can lead to new species by way of polyploidization, and polyploidy is duplication of sets of chromosomes. This happens when plants make pollen and ovules without the reduction division of meiosis. So the gametes, the sperm and the egg, are diploid rather than haploid. So we can get an autopolyploid resulting either from self-pollination or unreduced gametes between individuals of the same species or allopolyploids if gametes come from individuals of different species. And that's important because often different species have different numbers of chromosomes, so meiosis won't normally work well, and um, syngamy, etc. But if there are two sets of chromosomes, then it does work out. A hybrid could also undergo agamospermous reproduction, making seeds without sex. And that could perpetuate a genotype many, many times, like in dandelions, this is what happens. So if, even if a plant can't make gametes to reproduce, it can make many seeds genetically identical to itself.